All right, guys, welcome back. It's me, Daniel, with VintageMagic.com. We are at the Bearded Dragon. What's up, guys? Hey. All right, top eight's going on. We're just finishing up, but we have today celebrity guest Drew from the Facebook groups. He is, what groups did you start, by the way? Uh, the uh, CE and the ICE groups. Louder. C, uh, the Collector's Edition and International Collector's Edition Collector's Group, Yep. as well as the Alpha 40 group. Now for on Facebook. on Facebook, and I will put the link below of that uh, those awesome groups. Great groups, great guys, great environment. Everybody's a lot of fun. Before we start, Drew, tell us why you love old school. Oh man, I love old school because uh, you know it really harkens back to you know a nostalgic time for me when I first got started. Cards were fun. I love the design. I love brewing with you know crazy stuff. And uh, it was just you know back during a time when when they were experimenting with the game, see what would work and what wouldn't. So, the innocence of, of it all, right? Exactly. Now, when did you start, by the way, playing? I started playing uh, right at the tail end of 93. Okay. Uh, it was right in between when beta sold out and when Arabian Nights started. So I started playing with uh, cards that I was loaning from people because there was no cards to be had. Arabian Nights dropped. I, 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 bought a, I managed to buy five whole packs. With, uh, with my Arabian Nights? Of Arabian Nights. Oh my god. Uh, well, I ended up getting ten total, but that first run, the release date, I got five packs. I had a pre-order. And then I had to trade Arabian Knights cards for mana, for lands, so I could at least make a deck. Well, you traded your Arabian Knights for the land. For basic lands, yeah. <laughs> uh, what, yep. what, what, what edition of the basic lands did you switch? Oh, I don't, I, well, I had to get some uh, beta ones, I guess, at the time. Oh. Yeah, see, oh. I, think, I think Arabian Knights released on, like, the 5th of December, and then Unlimited came out, like, the 10th. Right. And, and I was literally playing every day. And so, they don't. And they don't give you free lands like back in the day, like the mana box. You no, know, like no, no, yeah, there's no, a land box. Okay. Well, I didn't know that. Oh, okay. No, All right, guys. So box. this is this is a, actually a cool thing here. Drew actually won the most creative deck for uh, the Eternal Central uh, Eternal Weekend tournament, right? With 180 players. 181, yeah. 81 players. I mean, it's a pretty. Big time tournament. Yep, took home the trophy. Very, very proud and excited. Uh, you know, came up with something that was unique, right? Unique and, and innovative, and I guess just different. You know, not one of the uh, not one of the tropes. Now, explain this uh, uh, creation, this chaos. Or what, can you show me what this is? Absolutely. So this was a, I guess, custom, handmade, hand painted resin chaos trophy. Uh, chaos Orb trophy. Uh, it actually comes apart. Wow. And this piece here comes off. Wow. Just gives you that there. Oh, and awesome. it is a deck box. Oh my god. With a magnetic lid. Did they tell us who made that? And guys? Um, I don't have the person's name, but uh, you know, I know a guy who knows a guy kind of a thing. Yeah. I think he's on Etsy. Okay. Um, I believe that they're made to order. Yeah. And I think there might be like a six week, you know. Ordering time because he makes them makes them custom to order, and he has a couple different versions. I think he has like a Sensei's Divining Top, you know, not not old school, right? But uh, yeah, he's got a couple different. You could probably Google that, right? Find like probably, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would imagine. I would yeah. imagine. So, and then the most creative deck, Drew's going to explain kind of the main deck and the sideboard. Yep. Um, tell us real. Tell us what's going on with this deck. What, so this is a uh, this is my Mana Barb's deck. Uh, this is actually iteration uh, two point five. I call it. So this is slightly different than what I played. Wait a second. At Eternal this was not on the. Was that in it? Not originally. No. Yeah. I actually wow. just added that. I changed, slotted that in. Crazy. And uh, yeah, nobody knows what this card does. Implements a sacrifice. Right. The reason why I use it is because it's really great counter strategy to, to the uh, Blood Moon meta game. You know, somebody drops Blood Moon, and and uh, typically you'd be hosed. So this this gives you an out, so you can still play your you know your blue cards or your red cards or you know or, or the other colors that you need. All right, why don't you show me kind of the premise of the deck so people can kind of understand it? So the the premise of the deck is basically like a like almost like a prison lock deck. Uh, what you want to try and do is it's very few lands, lots of rocks, and the idea is you get mana barbs out. Uh, and then it's just a lot of stuff that synergizes with mana barbs, so that forcing the opponent to constantly take damage when they want to do things. Three mana barbs, though, huh? Yeah, I was running four and felt that it was a bit overkill. You know, mm. one really does the job, two is almost gratuitous, and, and when you have those extra ones in your hand, not really doing anything, it doesn't help a lot. Uh, another really, really great underrated card is uh, Psychic Venom. Uh, you can drop that out early. Every time they tap that land, they take that two damage. And it works particularly well with the uh, Icy Manipulator. So, uh, 
actually in the event that we just got done playing, I had one opponent where I had <laughs> three Psychic Venoms on one of his lands, and I was tapping it every turn to do six damage. Wow. So Paralyze helps with the creatures? It does, because uh, it taps their creatures down, and then they got to pay four to untap them, and they're going to take Mana Barb's damage, or Psychic Venom damage if they want to do that. So it's a really nice, you know, kind of one mana. Uh, yeah. I see what's going on here. You're basically trying to... It's creatureless. Yep. With the, uh, the Mistress Factory, yep. you're, you're winning the race. Yep. But if, but this card, guys, this is, the, uh, this is, is a great card. This is really the key, mana short. So once you get your your mana barbs out and your psychic venoms out, you know, or some combination thereof, what you basically do is an instant during the upkeep, you pop out the mana short, forces them to tap down all of their lands. Uh, you know, kind of a poor man's time walk in a way, right? Because then it kind of locks them out of being able to use their lands that turn, but then also they take all the damage from mana barbs. So, again, uh, this evening, they had game, you know, during his upkeep, popped out the uh, mana short, he took 10 damage during his upkeep. Right. How much mana is this? This is a little short, but yeah. Uh, it has 20, I believe it's 25 sources. Let's see here, 6, 10, it is less 12, than 15... Uh, 17, 19, 21, 23, 25. No, no mana drain, huh? No mana drain. I no, I, I was trying to avoid a lot of the double blue stuff because you want to not have to tap lands unless you really, really need to. Right. So you want to remain versatile. So again, that's where power sync is also very handy. Right. Because they cast a spell, you power sync them, you force them to tap all their additional lands. Uh, you know, and that's where things like mana vaults come in handy. Mana vaults are really, really key in this deck. Right. All right, so let's talk about uh, the matchups. Like, what is the main deck weak against? What's the strongest? Well, so far, you know, it, it, it's it's a continuing work in progress, right? So what I'm finding is that the, the deck is, is a little bit more weaker against very fast aggro decks, like uh, White Weenie or, or uh, you know, Rug Crazies or, or anything. Or mono like Green. Lines. Mono Green, mono Rush. Black. Yeah, those kinds of things. Uh, so I, I was trying to play around with the sideboard a little bit this time. That's why I added in the city in a bottle because that really helps against things like rug crazies, um, and glooms against you know for white or pink weenie. Force field's always just kind of a nice you know backup card. Uh, and uh, another interesting addition, actually, I mainboarded this at EW and I decided to sideboard it this time was Primal Clive. And yes, I do apologize for having white border ones. I do have black border ones, but I was just uh, too damn lazy to go hunting for them. That's all right. It's budget. Who cares? Yep. So it's, it's a card that not so, really many people play. Uh, it, it's not super efficient, but what I really like is the versatility. And so for, for, for the four mana, you know, depending on who you're playing against, you can drop it out as, as a 1-6 wall. Say they, you know, they first turn Jews and Jin, and you need a blocker or earn him Jin. You know, or, or say they get out of Hippie, you can make it into a 2-2 two, two flyer. Or if they have... Uh, oh, that's right, right. Or if they have factories, you, know, you can make it a 3-3 three, three beater. And, and I'll trade that for a factory you know, off an opponent. So uh, it, it's, it's pretty nifty, and uh, it definitely takes a lot of people by surprise because it's not a card that people really ever see. Now, do you play this first before... Um, like, do you anticipate what they're going to play, or do you select it? Because you have to select it first, right? You can't yes. interchange it over. You no, can't no, no. mold. Yeah, you can't mold it over yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You declare it when it's yeah. cast, and then that's it. Yeah. yeah. So, so do you, you typically what was a typical use for it? What do you think? Uh, I would say a lot of times I, I end up either going with the wall or the uh, the two two flyer. Yeah. Um, you know, if they have no creatures out and, and it looks like maybe they're a creatureless deck, you know, I might drop it as a, as a three three hitter. Got it. Uh, it's another. You know, it's a nice another target for their disenchants. And what is it good against? Like, uh, what kind of decks is it good against? Like well, a, it worked particularly well against an Atog deck I played uh, not too long ago. It also did work really well against Mono Black, you know, because of the hippies or the, or the Jews and Jins. The aggro um, decks, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So really what the goal here is, you're trying to win the race, but you're also trying to stall for time. Correct. So then, And then the Mana Short is a game ender, like a Stormseeker-ish idea for that. Yeah, essentially, yeah. You're yeah. trying to kind of get your lock in place, and then t typically the way you know I would end up winning is, you, you know, you whittle them down in life enough to where they end up... They, they just can't cast anything. They can't play anything. But only two strip mines. That's interesting. Well, Why two that? strip mines? Why is that? So, it really only needs two strip mines. Uh, strip mm. mine is mainly, you know, the, the point of this deck is I don't want to destroy their lands. I want them to have as many lands out as possible so they can take maximum damage from management. Right, right. But if they, you know, real early game... First turn a library. Yeah, uh, that that's that can definitely be a. Well, that's a why I think like so. maybe like having the four strip mines because in the world of uh, you know library and all that, I mean four could be I don't know. It's just, it, it just seems like by having four strip mines, you can control what color lands they have, right? 
Yeah, you could. I mean, that, that could you know, and, and you know, it's something I may experiment with. Like right yeah. now, I'm running you know City of Brass, but then I have City in a Bottle on the sideboard. So you know, it's not super optimal. And plus, when I tap City of Brass, I'm taking an extra damage above and beyond the mana barbs. But sometimes you just need that color versatility. All right, know? explain this implements of sacrifice. I don't think anybody's ever played this card. <laughs> yeah, nobody's ever played this card. Um, the reason why I like implements of sacrifice is it's kind of. A, in a sense, it's a poor man's lotus. So it's really good against the meta of uh, Blood Moon. Uh, I've had Blood Moon played against me multiple times, which which would really, really hose me. And other than Implements of Sacrifice, the only out that I have against Blood Moon would be the Black Lotus. So with Implements of Sacrifice, even though all my lands are now mountains, I can sacrifice that and still make it into blue to kind of get the game finisher in. No Felwar uh, Stones or anything? I have I two, two Felwar Stones. Right. Soul Ring, the four mana vaults. The factories I like because they're they're you know they're good blockers, or, right. or, you know early game damage damage dealers. Right. Um, only running six duels currently. I, you know I really feel like this deck is like more like uh, they don't people are never anticipating this. No. And that, that that that's what's so they when you play a psychic venom they're like oh, okay this is like one of those psychic venom yeah. decks. But I think the mana barbs and mana short just starts getting to like like what are you doing? Like, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I've gotten like nothing but tremendous like you know yeah. positive, encouraging feedback and compliments, and, and you know it's been very uh, very positive. Everybody has fun playing against it. You know, win or lose, uh, I get a lot of comments like uh, well, you know what? Out of all the matches I played, this is the one I'm going to remember from this event. Or wow, I haven't seen Psychic Venom since college. You know, 25 years ago. Uh, you know, or sometimes you know you're, you're kind of piecing it together, and they're like, "Why is he playing this? Why is he playing that?" And then they see the they see the uh, combination come together, and they're like, they have that aha moment, which is just you know I, I love seeing that you know that expression on their, on their faces. It's fun. It, it, it's a deck that people can lose to and still have fun doing it. Yeah, you know? absolutely. All right, guys. Well, thanks again, uh, guys. Put in the comments below what you think about Drew's thanks. most creative deck at Eternal Weekend 2018. Uh, this is an awesome. A uh, prize, a great community uh, example of keeping the spirit of old school alive. It doesn't mean that you necessarily have to have the deck, Brian Weissman. You're hearing me out. Uh, you know, the Atok deck, the Mono Blacks. Try something new, try something different. By the way, when you manage short, you manage short at the end uh, of the upkeep. At the during upkeep, upkeep, during the upkeep, untap, upkeep. Right. Untap, up, because then draw. they can only respond with instance or, or yeah. you know. So they'll they cast. might counter that, but if they don't, and then they're gonna take all that damage. That's right. And they're all tapped out. That's right. Yeah, I mean, it's all about brewing. There's some people that say the format is solved. The format is not solved. There's still new and inv innovative and, and fun and creative things that people can do. Right. So. All right, Drew. Thanks again for your time, guys. I'll put in the links below of the two groups, the Alpha 40 group and also the ICE and CE group. More videos to come. Drew, thanks for sharing. Hey, thanks a lot. Dan. All right, guys. Appreciate thanks for watching. Take care. Have a good one.